So one week in to 2024, how's it going so far? I mean, the way the calendar's fallen, our first Sunday to be in worship together, uh, it's, we're almost a week into the new year. And so with that, I would ask, did you make any resolutions this year? And if you did, how's that going a week in? Uh, you know, it's that time of the year where the gyms are full and you regulars, you're just looking for March because it'll, it'll empty out again because people make decisions and then they give up on those decisions and then things get back to normal. Well, on the screen now, there is some survey information from Forbes. This is a survey of about 1,000 people conducted back in October of last year regarding New Year's resolutions and the type of resolutions that people make. And I know if you're in the back, it may be a little hard to read some of it. And I'm not going to bore you with reading through it. Um, improving fitness, finance, health, those top the list. And that tends to be very, very normal. But if you can see the list, there's, uh, there's one thing among these thousand people who were surveyed, there is one thing that is conspicuously absent from the list, and, and that is there is nothing in this chart related to resolutions about where people are saying, hey, I want to strengthen my walk with the Lord. And I realize the survey may not have been constructed to include God's stuff in it. They may not have constructed it that way, and so you're not going to see those kinds of results. But, but even that would speak to a lack of spirituality in our culture. But for today and through January, we're going to talk about some spiritual resolutions, but from a bit of a different perspective. And let me tell you where this idea comes from. About a year ago, I'm scrolling social media, and Todd Clippard, who preaches down at the Burleson Congregation just outside of Hamilton, he was talking about uh, resolutions, but he was, he was asking from a different perspective. He said, what if Jesus were to make your resolutions for you? And that really grabbed my attention because that's not the way we normally think about it. Because if Jesus gets involved in making my resolutions or yours, uh, I'm thinking that the priorities from Jesus are going to be drastically different than what you're seeing up on the screen right now. And it also occurred to me that if Jesus were to start making my resolutions and yours, what he would prescribe would be exactly what you need and exactly what I need to, to strengthen my walk and my commitment to him. In other words, he would achieve perfection in establishing just the right personalized resolution for each and every individual in this room. Now, I get it resolutions may not be your thing. You know, some of us, we've realized we struggle so much in, in keeping a resolution, we, we've decided it's just better not to even create one or start one, and I get that. Uh, one author that I follow, uh, he's been writing about uh, promoting the idea of 18-day, what he calls, sprints. In other words, don't set a resolution for the year. Set an 18-year, uh, an 18 uh, an 18-day goal where for 18 days I'm going to do X. For 18 days I'm going to do Y because his take is we can run a sprint. And in a lot of ways, we're better built for a sprint than a marathon. And so I, I like what he's doing. But even so, whichever way we go, it's worth doing some self-examination. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 calls us to do that. And so we want to do this from the perspective of if Jesus looked at your life or Jesus looked at my life. Another way to think about it, if Jesus called you in for an annual performance review on your relationship with him and he starts assessing your life, what might he start saying we need? And, and I get it. We're not going to get a personalized re re resolution from him. But I think if we think about some things he might say to all of us, it will be a compelling way to self-examine. So what if he were to just simply say, as he looked at you and as he looked at me and, and he thought about the year upcoming, what if he just said, all I need you to do is just put me first? 
He might need to say that to me sometimes. He might need to say that to you sometimes. He might need to say that to us all of the times. And and maybe at some point you've been involved in one of those put-me-first conversations with somebody in life. Maybe uh, you've been in a relationship with somebody and, and you've accused them of not putting you first in the relationship because you feel like they weren't properly valuing you, weren't properly giving you time or whatever. Or, or maybe you've been in a relationship where someone has accused you of that. Hey, you need to put me first. You need to pay attention to me. Well, see, the truth is, as it relates to people, and this may strike us as a bit odd, But as it relates to people, none of us deserve to be put first by anyone. In fact, if someone is putting you first in his or her life, that person's priorities are not biblical. That person's priorities are out of order. In certain relationships now, obviously, say a marriage or a dating relationship that's moving toward marriage, you, you could probably make the case for being put second, but Jesus has always demanded first place. If you're going to have a relationship with me, Jesus says, I've got to be first. But the question is, is he? Is he first in my life? Is he first in your life? Now, as we go back to the New Testament during his ministry, not everyone always was following Jesus for the right reasons. After all, you think about his teachings and you had Jewish leadership and there was always this tension. And if you'd been watching Jesus teach for very long, you knew he was going to show up and he was going to say something. And there were going to be sparks because every time he spoke, it, it undercut the, the things that they were trying to do to people. And so you didn't know what was going to happen next. And you'd want to see that. And then Jesus, as he was going about, he would heal people. And I'm thinking that had to be an amazing thing to see. And then there was also the occasional free meal. If you followed Jesus long enough, he might just perform a miracle and feed 4,000 or 5,000 people at a time. And so not everybody was following Jesus for all the right reasons. And so in Luke chapter 14... Jesus made it a point to explain what it meant to truly follow him. He he specifically talks in the text about what it means to count the cost. And what he's doing in that teaching is he's sifting his audience. He's making sure they understand what's at stake. Uh, Perhaps a better way to say it is that Jesus lays this out so that the audience can sift themselves. Because Jesus knew that all those people there on the day, he knew the heart of every person. Just like he knows the heart of every one of us assembled in this room for worship today. But he also understood that as people we need to be put in a position to self-examine, to hear him teach and then go to the mirror and, and see what our life looks like in comparison to what he's just taught. And so in Luke chapter 14 verse 25 beginning, Jesus begins to explain what putting him first looks like. Let's go to the text. Luke 14, verse 25. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wait, Jesus, you're you're, you're saying hate, hate, father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. How much do you love your blood family? Because there's something to understand here in the text. We all love our blood families. And he's not calling us to love our blood families any less than we do. That's not what he's doing. He's simply saying that loving him 
and putting him first, it involves loving him at a level that makes our love for all of these people he's just named look like hate in a comparative way. We love him so much more that it looks like hate when you think about those other folks in your life that you value. And the problem is, I read that, and I'm still trying to get there. And you're probably still trying to get there as well. But and it's hard because he's saying, if you don't love me this much more than you love them, you cannot be my disciple. And I don't like hearing that. And you may not either. But we've got to get it right, or we've got to be moving toward getting it right. Now, culturally, then, family was extremely important. The head of the family was probably going to arrange your marriage and would often have everything to do with how you were going to make your living. And so if you went out and shamed the family in some way, and following Jesus might have been the way to shame the family in some cases, you go out and shame the family and you might suddenly be dead to them. You ever read one of those stories about a family where where somebody in the family, they go off and they do something and become dead to the family, and the family actually holds a memorial service for the person that in their eyes is now dead? The person's not really dead physically, but in our eyes they're dead, and so they actually have a memorial service for that person. You see why love of family could have been bringing a person in the first century to a serious crossroads. Your future financial success might have everything to do with being in good graces with the head of your family. And even if you didn't love your family the way you should, it was possible to allow them to then stand in the way of your relationship with Jesus because you didn't want them to turn your life into a veritable hell on earth, casting you out and making it very hard for you to make your way through life. But what about us as it relates to family? Do I have family members that I value more than I value Jesus. Is there a family member I'll listen to and go along with even with when what they want contradicts what Jesus has said he wants? Another way to say that is, will I go along with them when what they want isn't what Jesus has said is right? Because if Jesus mandates it, it's right, it's truth. There's another one that will happen from time to time. A person will say no to obeying our Lord, obeying the gospel, immersing themselves into baptism as the scripture teaches because uh, what a family member might think about that, what a family member might believe about that. Um, And sometimes it may be a person that's no longer even alive. And so as kindly as I know how to say it, that's elevating people above God. Remember what also Jesus says at the end of verse 26 in our text. He says, being a disciple also involves hating one's own life. And then he says in verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, remember what this is and remember what this isn't. The second great commandment right after loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind is to love your neighbor as you do yourself, Matthew 22, verse 39. So the Lord understands that it's normal for you to love yourself and me to love myself. And again, he's not necessarily calling us to love self less, but he is calling us to put him first by us being dead to the world, dead to selfish desires that get in the way of us fulfilling our spiritual purpose in life. If I'm a Christian, my purpose is supposed to be spending my time on this planet, living a life devoted to Jesus, and then trying to find some other folks who want to do the same thing. And yes, I will work. And yes, I'll go do some things that are fun. Jesus understood and and sent his disciples to rest and to be recreated. We need all of that. 
Yet the umbrella over my life is putting him first and fulfilling his purpose for my life so that no matter what else may be going on and no matter what else it may cost me, Jesus comes first. Related to cost in our text, he says we would do well to count the cost of following him before we ever start following And he illustrates with things we understand. Notice verse 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000, or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. And then he says, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. See, Jesus is attempting to explain that counting the cost as it relates to following him means putting him first. In other words, the cost of truly putting him first, it may involve forsaking uh, various interests, various affections, various possessions of this present life. Related to verse 33 where he says, so then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. Is there anything, we talked about people, do you value people more than Jesus? Is there anything you value more than Jesus? Is there anything in your life you would refuse to give up for him? And if so, first you found your idol You've identified then the obstacle that you've got to overcome if you're truly going to put him first. One of the good things about Scripture is it doesn't call us to a major task without explaining or reminding us of why it matters, why it's important. And in fact, in Colossians chapter 1, Sam read from there a few minutes ago, Paul reminds us in such a way that when, when you think about, well, should I put Jesus first? Does that really make sense? Is that really logical? When you read Colossians 1, the text that Sam read, what you begin to understand is that putting Jesus first is actually a no-brainer. Let's go back through those verses. For this reason also, this is Colossians 1 verse 9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, Uh, And if you go back in the verse or back in the text, because of your faith in Christ, because of your love for the brothers and sisters, uh, the eternal hope that you now possess because you're in him, he says, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk, so that you'll live in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father. Why? The Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. And then notice 13 and 14. This is what the Father did. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us, he conveyed us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. The the transaction there that occurs through our obedience to the gospel in whom we have redemption because God provides redemption, then the forgiveness of sins. Why do you put Jesus first? Because you've been rescued. Why do you put Jesus first? You've been transferred into his kingdom. Why do you put Jesus first? Because you've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. That's the reason it's a no-brainer to put him first. And so the question becomes, am I putting Jesus first in my life? The question is simple but it's profound. The question is brief, but it's all-encompassing. 
based on his assessment of my life, would Jesus conclude that I'm putting him first? Would Jesus conclude that I'm putting him first in my marriage? And we need to be one more slide forward if we can. Would Jesus conclude that I'm putting him first? Actually, we're, yeah, if we can get to that, the one about marriage. Spent a couple of weeks in December talking about God's plan for marriage. And I continue to be more convinced than ever that we don't spend enough time here in the church talking about what God wants to see in our marriages. We don't talk about it enough especially since we live in a culture that doesn't value marriage in the way that God does. Even among some church-going people, marriage isn't valued. And so the question is, am I putting Jesus first in my marriage? Who comes first, Jesus or my spouse? Do I sometimes choose not to assemble with the church family to offer up my worship to the Lord when my spouse wants me to go do something else instead? If so, it's worth at least asking whether I've prioritized my spouse over my relationship with Jesus. Because remember what Jesus said, you've got to love me so much that your love for your spouse looks like hate in comparison because we've got to never lose sight of the goal. Uh, when you think about what's supposed to happen in a marriage, it ought to be about both husband and wife putting Jesus first. And when that occurs, a great thing happens. Visualize in your mind a triangle with God on top, husband, wife. And you've heard this illustration but if I'm putting my, my, my relationship with God first and my spouse is putting relationship with God first, as I grow closer to God and as my spouse grows closer to God, what's happening? We are by default also growing closer to each other. You want a better relationship with your spouse? Put God first in your life and make sure your spouse is putting God first in, in their lives. And when that happens, you're going to have a better marriage. It happens by default. Am I putting Jesus first in my home? Do I open my Bible at home? Do my children ever hear about Jesus in my home? Remember under the old law, God declared the home to be the place where children would learn God's law. And that mandate came straight in the New Testament. Ephesians 6 verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Do our children see Jesus being modeled at home? Because sometimes we play nice all day and, and we save some of our most non-putting Jesus first um, behavior. We reserve that for home. And all I'm asking is whether Jesus can look into our homes and clearly see that he comes first. Am I putting Jesus first in my church attendance and in my involvement? Where will I be at 6 o'clock this evening? The church family will be assembled for a time of Bible study and fellowship. It, it's an aspect of church life that's very, very consistent with putting Jesus first. Same question for Wednesday evening at 6.30, church family assembled for Bible study, for fellowship. What ministry or ministries, the actual work of the church that extends beyond simply attending for worship, what ministries will I choose to involve myself in this year uh, as part of putting Jesus first in my life? Because please don't miss this. There's a powerful truth that accompanies deciding that my goal is simply going to be to put Jesus first. When I declare that my goal is to simply put him first, then I'm no longer operating from a place of attempting to determine what my minimum obligation to Jesus is. 
I'm going to say that one more time because I don't think we all heard it. I, I'm no longer, if I decide I'm going to just put Jesus first, I'm no longer operating uh, with a paradigm that says I've got to figure out what the minimum amount of, of requirement Jesus has placed on me. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about putting him first. And that's a big difference. I'm not thinking anymore about whether one sh worship service a, a week is enough or two or is that Bible class thing really required of me? I'm not thinking about those things anymore because I'm trying to put him first. It becomes a question of what best reflects in my life putting Jesus first. Another way to ask it, tonight at 6, what might I possibly be doing with my time that would better reflect my commitment to putting him first than being here, same question for midweek, and consider the value. And if you're not going to think about value for you, think about value as it relates to your kids. Let's be generous and say that if you're here for two hours on Sunday morning and an hour tonight, an hour on Wednesday night, about four hours, let's say that equates to one school day. And it actually doesn't, a four doesn't quite equate to the required six for school, but if school time for the week was equal to time spent here, it would take about three and a half years for our kids to get through one grade. If you base it on actual hours, four weeks a year, four hours a week here versus six hours a week at school, that to get to 1,080 required hours like it takes at school, you would need to complete a grade. It'd take over five years to get through a grade. And then think about how more that number balloons if, if I've just got my kids here for one class a week or maybe no classes a week. Our schools are wonderful. They do great work. We've got a lot of educators in here. Great, great work is done. But see, what our schools are doing, and preparing our kids for what the Bible calls a vapor. If you get 100 years here, you've had a good life, and the Bible calls that a vapor. And what we're working on here is trying to get each other ready for eternity. You tell me which is more important, 100 years or eternity. And so what all this means is that if I'm truly going to make this commitment to put him first in my life, it might end up requiring me to make some choices, to make some decisions, that when the world looks at what I'm doing, people who don't understand what I'm trying to accomplish, one of the th it might look a little strange to some folks out there in the world. Putting Jesus first might mean working fewer hours. Putting Jesus first might mean playing fewer sports. Putting Jesus first might mean signing your kids up for fewer sports. Putting Jesus first might mean me cutting back on some of my other recreational activities, taking fewer vacations, consuming less entertainment. What, what, and, and I get it. I, I've, just, I've just walked over every foot in this room, including my own. But we talk about these things because Jesus wants our hearts. That, that mandate that he put there in Luke chapter 14, if I'm not first, you can't be my disciple, he didn't just say that for fun. He said that because he meant it. And I also get it. None of those things I just mentioned, those choices we might have to make, none of those things I mentioned are things that are bad or sinful in and of themselves. But remember Cade's devotional Wednesday evening? He took us to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and he reminded us Wednesday night that that verse teaches us that not everything, it tells us we're running a marathon, but then the verse also reminds us that not everything that gets us off track and hinders us and keeps us from running the race that we're running, not everything's sinful because the verse talks about both things, both encumbrances and Sins. The verse says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, God provides us with every blessing to enjoy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. But if those blessings distract me and encumber me in such a way that they prevent me from putting Jesus first, which includes putting the church that he died for first, then, then I've got to make changes in my life. Remember Martha 
And remember her distractions in Luke chapter 10. Uh, a good deed she's doing, and Jesus called her good deed a distraction. And, and what she was doing, she thought she was putting Jesus first. She was so intent on trying to fix Jesus a meal, it made her get mad at her sister. And when she got mad at her sister, Jesus said, Hey, you are, you're worried, you're distracted, you're distressed, and your priorities are out of line because what she wasn't doing was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Please understand me today. I don't for a minute doubt our love for the Lord. I don't doubt that for a minute. I know we love the Lord. I'm simply asking if we can elevate that love by doing a better job of genuinely putting Him first in our lives because my belief is that all of us can find a gap that needs to be closed, an area where we can improve. Gary mentioned that in, in, in his prayer to God this morning, that all of us have opportunities. And I'm asking us to look for those opportunities and then find out what they are and work on them. Because you see, there's coming a day when every person is going to understand and is going to acknowledge that Jesus is first, that Jesus is King of kings, and that Jesus is Lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Every person is going to bow the knee before Jesus. Every day, or on that day, every person is going to understand that Jesus actually was and is. He's been first all along. But to be welcomed into heaven on that day, when we bow that knee to him, my life needs to reflect that I'm putting him first today. Because if I bow the knee before him for the very first time on that day, if I don't ever recognize he's first until the day of judgment, then, then it's probably going to be way too late. And so does your life reflect that you're putting Jesus first right now? After all, he went to the cross he died for you. He didn't put you first. He put the will of his Father first. But he put you right there in behind him. He put me right there in behind, behind that. We were second. And so if Jesus isn't first, maybe you need to begin a walk with him today by obeying the gospel by being immersed into Christ so that your sins can be forgiven to begin that walk. That's how you put him first if you're not a Christian yet. You begin your walk with him through obedience to the gospel. Most of us have done that. And so if the adjustments you need to make in your life, if they are adjustments where you want the church to, to pray for you and to work with you as you work through that, if you need to respond publicly, our shepherds are ready to pray with you and for you. In a lot of cases, I realize this is one where you take it home and you, and you get with God one-on-one -on -one and, and you recommit to the things you need to recommit to, and that's fine as well. I just ask that all of us walk out of here today committed that no matter what, we're going to put Jesus first. If you have a need we can help you with today, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing.